Hi, everyone, and welcome to Book It. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. We have an exciting show ahead for you, so let's get to it. We begin with a fascinating story of triumph, tragedy, and a massive corporate empire. Lloyda Lewis is a philanthropist, attorney, mother, and activist. She also ran a billion-dollar company after her husband, financial powerhouse Reginald Lewis, died at just 50 years old. Now she's out with a candid memoir that details her journey. It's called Why Should Guys Have All the Fun? Lloyda, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me, Caroline. There is so much that I want to talk about, but let's begin with the love story you and your husband, Reginald Lewis. It is 1968 in New York City. He is a Harvard-trained attorney. You are visiting New York from the Philippines, an attorney yourself, and you end up on a blind date. What did you think of him? Well, the first time I met him was interesting because I have never dated uh, on a double date. Yeah. In the Philippines, we always have group dates. Got it. But, you know, I'm always ready for adventure. <laughs> And so, as we were just moving out of the, of the hotel, he held my elbow to help me out. But in my mind, in the Philippines, you don't touch. So in ah, my mind, he's fresh. He's fresh. <laughs> <laughs> but our first meeting was really, you know, energetic and full of give and take. Since he's a lawyer, I'm a lawyer. Many things that I said, he has something to say. Many things that he said, I had something to say. But there was one thing that impressed me. When I was talking about being he being African American, I was talking about Joe Lewis, you know, the first black world champion in, in, in boxing. He immediately cut it cut me off. Uh -huh. I'm international. Huh. So even at 25, he already had dreams for himself. And sure enough, 20 years later, he bought Beatrice International Foods. Yes. 64 companies in 31 countries. It, it, remarkable. And and we should point out here that ultimately your husband he became the first black American to build a billion dollar company. But actually it was not been, he acquired it on a leverage buyout. Yes. It means all borrowed, almost all borrowed money. Yes. At that time in the 1980s, you know, financiers were buying companies, Nabisco, for yes. billions of dollars. Yes. And Mr. Lewis was the first one, African American, to acquire on a leverage buyout, borrowed money, a $1 billion company. You refer to him as Mr. Lewis. Can you tell us the story behind why you do that? Well, when he was a, an associate at Paul Weiss, all the secretaries would call Mr. Mr. Um, Mr. Berman, Mr. Slattery, you know, Mr. Uh, Smith. But when they come to my husband's room, they would call him Reggie. No, you call me Mr. Lewis. In other words, just because I'm black, you can call me by my first name, but all the white associates you call by Mr. This and That. Yes. So I see to it that when I refer to him, to strangers, he should be called Mr. Lewis as a sign of respect. As a sign of respect, I understand that. Your book is called Why Should Guys Have All the Fun? Uh, the title is a nod to your husband's book, which was Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? And we've touched on this a bit. but. Your husband, as you describe him, was someone who felt very strongly about standing up to discrimination and prejudice. Do you feel that that was a significant driver of his success? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. When he was sick and we were looking at um, the inauguration of President Clinton, he was sort of like wistfully saying, mm, I could have gone politics. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, darling. You went, you, from the beginning, you wanted to go into finance, into buying businesses. And so when I told him, this is, this is the path you chose, and then he sort of smiled, and yes, I disproved a lie. Yes. In other words, as a black man, he can go to the highest ranks of corporate America, just like any white man. And his success did uh, build very quickly, but the deal that changed everything, as you've already alluded to, was the Beatrice deal. That really dramatically changed everything. It did, yes. And so he tried to buy a company while practicing law, and he failed three times. Hmm. So instead of saying, because of racism, because of him and him and him, he said, I am doing something wrong. Three fingers are pointing at him. And what was he doing wrong? After studying all the successful leverage buyout, he said, I know it. I am my own lawyer. I am my own investment banker. I am my own accountant. So the next time a new deal came along, he hired 
Bear Stearns, it's, it's gone now, but he, Phyllis Less was his investment banker, um, Deloitte and Touche was his uh, um, accountant, mm -hmm. and he hired another law firm. So he really made his own decisions in that success story. He made his own decisions and he was very wise, understanding what he was doing wrong and then correcting it. Exactly, learn from that mistake. Yes. Now you're also very accomplished in your own right. You were the first Filipino woman to pass the New York bar exam without having gone to law school in the U.S. Do I have that right? That's correct, yes. And you became an immigration attorney. You wrote about the citizenship process. You raised two girls. So you were doing a lot while your husband was also becoming very successful. That's true. And I have to warn, especially women who are watching now, you can have it all, but not all at the same time. Mm. Because Such I was good advice. Yes, because I was trying to do all. I have a very ambitious, hard, hardworking husband who wants to go to the very top. I have two girls who are going to school. I have, I have a full-time job with immigration and naturalization service, and I wanted to be a real estate tycoon. <laughs> all force, all crazy. It was crazy, and what happened? My body broke out. I got TB, tuberculosis. Yes, I, I remember that. In and I had to stay out of work for three months. Yeah. You know, so for women who want to do it all, you've got to make priorities. Yeah. Because if not, your health or your marriage yeah. or your children will be maladjusted. Right. So you can have it all, but not all at the same time. In 1992, your husband, and he was just 50 years old, was diagnosed with brain cancer. That had to be devastating. Can you take us back to that time period? During the time that, that we discovered, December 31, that it was truly brain cancer, I always had faith. You know, God said, you pray, God will hear you, that he will be healed. And so in 19 days, he was gone. So it was really Goodness. like, it was really like, couldn't concentrate. I cried all the time because how could it happen that we were supposed to grow old together. And he refused chemotherapy and radiation, is that That's right? That's it. He didn't want chemotherapy nor radiation because he said, I don't want my brain to be fired and it will not cure me anyway. I know that after your husband died, uh, you say in the book you really fell apart for some period of time. But then you got focused again. You had your girls to raise. You also wanted to finish the things that your husband was not able to finish, his book, but also you decided to step in yourself and run the company. Now you had not run a major business before despite how accomplished you are. So was that intimidating? It took me some time, actually six months, before I said, I sort of like understood, hey, Loida, you are mother and father to your daughters. Yes. And you have to finish the book. And then the company at that time was going down, bank, I mean, red, red, red in the right. bottom line. Why? Because a strong leader died suddenly. Yes. 1993 was the worst recession in Europe. And it rained in Spain and France and Germany and Italy and the Canary Islands and in Northern Europe. And 50% of our revenue was ice cream. And people don't really love ice cream when it's rainy and cold, no, right? No, 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 yes. no. So that means our revenue is down and our expenses remain high. Okay, so why did I decide to take over, this was his life. It cannot fail. Failure was not an option. Mm -hmm. So I decided take over so that if it fails, I don't have to point fingers to somebody else. Yes. It's my fault. And if it succeeds, it's because I have chosen good people to, to, to run it with me. And you take over and you start slashing costs and you fire people. You even sell the company Jet. But ultimately, you do turn it around. I, I remember you were, you were named one of the country's top female executives. I saw a, a headline from the Times in, I believe it was 1996, that said, Mrs. Lewis proves her critics wrong. That had to feel good. Yes, but I didn't, you know, it's not really, I'm not doing it to get praise. I'm doing it because it's got to be done. You know, common sense. Your income is down. Your expenses are high. Common sense. Cut expenses, increase income. You know, so, I, you know, and then what are, the, what are the expenses? A jet, three million a year. I don't need a jet, I can go commercial. Uh, we have 30,000 square feet of space. Because I was cutting expenses, got down to 10,000. And 
the, you know, we have, Mr. Lewis had chosen all of these executives, but I don't need all of them because we have different values, but I saw to it that determination pay that I gave them is acceptable to them and me. Wow. So you really had to make some tough decisions, though. You have to do it. You have to do it. Otherwise, you know, the company goes down. What would you like people to know about your husband? That I want people to know that you have to dream, and, but you have to work hard, one foot in front of the other. Mr. Lewis understood from the time he was young that he has to practice, he has to work hard, and he has to persevere. Never take no for an answer. In fact, I told him no three times. <laughs> <laughs> A last question for you. You say in the book that you've been asked many times why you never married again. Can you share that answer with us? Well, I'm a one-man woman, okay? And I wear my wedding ring so that people will know I'm not available. And why? Because I had a great life. When you have been married to a king, why settle for a prince? You must miss him. I do. Thank you so much for all this time. Thank you. It was such a great pleasure to chat with you and to have all this time to, to talk about your remarkable, remarkable story. Thank you for having me. Now to our regular contributor, Adrian Cepeda. He is a CUNY grad, bookstore owner, and podcast host, and you might know him as Book Poppy on social media. Adrian is back with another author interview, so let's head to our podcast studio for that. Hi everyone, this is Adrian Cepeda, also known as Book Papi on TikTok. I'm here with Jasmine Hernandez, founder of Gallery Girls, and the book We Are Here, Visionaries of Color Transforming the Art World. Hi, welcome Jasmine, gracias. Adrian, thank you so much, I'm so honored to be here. And I'm, I love CUNY TV, shout out to y'all. Yeah, shout out CUNY. I, so glad you're here because I made a TikTok, and the TikTok is Decolonizing Your Coffee Table. You, your book was one I recommended because I loved it so much. And we'll get into that in a bit. But before that, I want to hear where you're from, your culture, your roots, your pronouns, all that, please. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so Jasmine Hernandez, uh, identify as she, her, first-gen black Latina, Afro-Dominican American, originally born on Dykeman, um, and then we moved to Queens. So I have a big history with Queens. We, we moved to Jamaica, Queens in like the early 80s. I lived in Jamaica, Ozone Park, Far Rockaway. I was always a very creative child, so I'm an 80s baby with like an IV drip to like MTV, <laughs> VH1, BET, um, devouring fashion magazines. So creativity was really a tool for me because uh, I grew up in a single parent household with me and my brother and, and my mother, and she was, you know, <laughs> mommy and daddy. So cr creativity was really like a tool to keep me inspired, keep me motivated, and keep me safe. <laughs> Shout out to mom. <laughs> I grew up in a single, my mom was widowed and we grew up wow. and she's the reason why I even love reading. So like she's the Beautiful. reason why I even have the bookstore, I even do book content, anything. Um, but that's amazing. Go Queens. <laughs> which <laughs> I didn't realize. How has your culture, being Dominicana, Afro-Dominican, affected your writing, your gallery and all these things that you do and creativity wise? I want to celebrate us always. Uh, we should tell our own stories, uh, not other folks. Um, I love the era that we're in now because social media and internet are like storytelling storytelling tools and we can just you know directly connect with our audience um there's so many dope creatives out right now afro latinx latinx um it's an amazing time so creativity is like the the well that i pull from um re, you know my love for reading like being a voracious reader you know our house didn't have a lot of abundance but one abundance was literature and books so i was like i don't know eight years old re reading hist reading historical fiction and reading biographies on like Hollywood um, <laughs> icons, like my mom loved like very white Hollywood icons. So I had to like read about Grace Kelly and at the same time, like loving, I don't know, Donna Summer and like hip hop and all that. Yeah. But um, creativity and literature was always like the, the tools that, that helped me through life. That's so, that's so <laughs> dope, I love that, I love that. And okay, so Gallery Girls, please. I want everyone to know about it because it's dope. It's a great idea, great creation. Please describe it to everyone. 
Thank you so much. It's an indie beloved DIY website. It's over a decade old. I founded it in 2012 with someone else, and eventually I just shaped it and took it over. Um, I love the art world, and I didn't have, and I started this at the age of 32. So I really, folks that are, you know, 30s and 40s, and you're feeling like stuck, and I don't know where to begin, you can begin at any point, at any level. Mm -hmm. um, when I started my website at 32, I already had like a decade of working in fashion. So I was like a grown woman stepping into a new industry, pivoting from fashion to art and um, the internet and, and social media were the only tools that I needed um, Instagram was a big research tool that's how I discovered artists many of the artists in the book started out as IG crushes and I <laughs> they're amazing and I love them and a DM led to a studio visit and it led to like a friendship IRL and um, so Gallery Girls was, was very organic I don't have like an academic tone I write very openly very plainly very simply about art um, and it's all about accessibility so the website is super organic. It's like reviews of exhibitions, it's artist interviews, it's studio visits, and it's also fashion because I love fashion. So fashion exhibits, fashion photography exhibits, you know, fashion events. The art world is very stylish, so I love to capture all the energy on the website as well. That's beautiful. <laughs> and that, that's important. And did you know that going in that you were never going to change the voice? Because like the academia voice, I deal with the same thing in literature because it's a very wide space and it's a very like an elitist because everyone's literature, literature, literature. But I talk and I dress and I step into that space every time the way I am. For you, was it always like you were going into it that way or did you make a conscious like decision? Absolutely. It was always going to be that way because I wanted readers to know what I look like, who I was, what my background was. Someone that looks like me can enter these white box, white dominated art spaces. Um, we create the culture anyway. Um, they're gonna like catch up to us anyway. Um, we should be like we should be the voices, and we should be telling our own stories. Love that, <laughs> man. We have quotables and quotables over here. These are captions right here. Who needs Drake when we got sound bites. captions like this? <laughs> now the book. We are here. Love that title. So I put books on display not through the spine all the time, but this book is always like front facing because wow. we are here. Like the minute you walk into the store, you see we are here. Wow. And the reason for that is because I want people to know like we're here. People look to the right, they see the Ecuadorian flag. Like, you know, I'm here. Like this is where we I am. We are here. That title, was it the title from the beginning? Did you come up with it? I know there's like a lot of things that going into titles for books, but please. So funnily enough, um, I was eating a Greek salad and I was having lunch. This was like 2019. And <laughs> I was eating a salad and I was, I was putting the fork in my mouth with lettuce. Boom, We Are Here just popped into my brain. My editor and I, my editor and my agent, the three of us, you know, we're brainstorming. And uh, we had similar titles, but um, We Are Here just popped into my head. Literally, I was having lunch and it just popped into my head. And I was like, that, it has to be that. And it, it's resonated. Yeah, no, it is. Because <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the whole thing with like making your seat at the table, yes. making your own table, right? Like announcing that we are here. I love it. It couldn't have Definitely. been a better title. I yeah. absolutely love it. So the idea of the book, when you came up with it, did what was like the biggest hurdle or was there any hurdles or it was just came so organically like and it was just like a creation of yours um so my so okay my pathway to becoming an author has been non-linear i started writing fiction first which one day maybe that fiction will be published let's go but my agent was like your fiction needs a lot of work let's do something in the non-fiction space and people mm -hmm. have always said um your book is your i mean not your book i'm sorry gallery girls is literally can be anthologized into a book you can take all those interviews from all those years and turn it into an anthology of artist interviews and so the seed that seed was always in my head and then my agent was like let's absolutely do this I signed with her like September. We started meeting publishers in November, December, and then like of 2018. Signed with her in September 2018, meetings November, December of 2018, and then I got um, an offer January of 2019. Things do not move that quickly. Yeah. No. So I'm super aware. Um, but Abrams was super keen to add this book to their collection. They love niche, coffee table, illustrated, mm -hmm. creative nonfiction books. And like they saw this book in their family. Um, it's it's the people in the book that make the book. It's, and this book is not about me, and it's it's not about me at all. There, there's an intro. You get to hear my story, but they should be centered. Um, they're all superstars. It's intergenerational. Mm -hmm. It's 50 folks, different identities, all black and POC. It's artists and also art workers, because art workers put artists on, the curators, the gallery owners, the gallery, mm -hmm. um, the gallery directors. So it's a celebration of um, artists and art workers, black right. and POC, intergenerational. Yeah, I love that. That's beautiful. Jasmine, <laughs> thank you.
Thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate it. You guys can guide this book anywhere. Bookshop, support your indie bookshop. You can support me, of course. But Jasmine, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you, Adrian. Amazing. We are back with another edition of The Fine Print, talking the business side of books. Today we are digging into how authors are doing when it comes to making a living. Andrew Albanese, executive editor with Publishers Weekly, is here to tell us about some new research on that front. Andrew, thanks so much for stopping by. Thanks so much for having me. So first of all, tell us a little bit about the study, and then what's the main takeaway? Sure, so the study was conducted by the U.S. Authors Guild, which is the largest author advocacy group in the nation. And this is a study they do regularly. They've done it before. The last one was five years ago in 2018. And it looks at income for authors. Now, this is both book income and non-book income. Okay. Book income is, of course, royalties and licensing fees, anything that comes from the sale of the book. Non-book income is writing for newspapers or websites or doing speaking, et cetera. And the top line numbers are not great, shall we say. So from the, the median pre-tax book income for a writer today is about $2,000 a year. Wow. Exactly. So maybe half a month's rent in New York City, right? That is pretty staggering. It's pretty staggeringly low. low. But if you take the non-book income, it rises to $5,000 a year. But still? Staggeringly low, yes. Yes. Absolutely. And now, now there's some good news in the report, too. The, the income is actually up about 9% from the last survey in okay. 2018. Um, and for full-time established authors, these are authors that publish multiple books dating back to before 2018, so mm -hmm. over decades, their income is up 21%. Okay, that's interesting. But they're still at about $23,000 a year. These right. are full-time established authors making about $23,000. I have to say that that is somewhat surprising to me. It is a little surprising, but at the same time, you know, not so much because Books are hard, right? That's true, and there are a lot of them. And while we know that some authors do very, very well financially, mm -hmm. um, it seems like for most of them, it's still a bit of a slog. You know, it's always been true that there's very few authors who can just make money from writing books. You know, right. many, if not most authors, have something else that they do. They're doing something else on yes. the side as well. So what does the study tell us about uh, self-published versus traditionally published authors. This is one of the most interesting parts of this survey, and it's something that we've been charting for the last decade. Self-publishing is growing. Mm -hmm. Self-publishing is about 50% of the authors who responded to this survey now. Gone is the stigma where you know self-publishing used to mean you had a right. garage full right. of books that you bought from a vanity press, right? That, right. that gosh, you paid them like a right. ton of money right. for this. You know, there's a lot of great services. A lot of it is digital. Right. And there's a number of authors, an increasing number of authors, who are finding that they no longer have a home in a traditional public publishing house, that they've hit the line where it makes more sense for them to be their own publisher and use these services like Amazon or Ingram and to reach their readers directly, okay. uh, that they take home more money from doing that. And that's, you know, in the survey, we're finding that more and more authors are doing that and doing it successfully. Okay, that's interesting. And I am always fascinated by this question, Andrew. What about genre? Which authors seem to do the best financially on that front? Yeah, so obviously if you can look at the bestseller list and see, broadly speaking, with traditional publishers, it's general fiction and general nonfiction. But if you look in the numbers here, in the genre market, and genre really is you know, the fun part of fiction, that's your yeah. romance and yeah. sci-fi and mysteries and thrillers, all the good stuff. I would point to the romance writers who okay. really lead the way. Romance writers and romance readers who are a, a special breed unto themselves. <laughs> it is incredible how prolific romance writers are and incredible how voracious romance readers are. It's so interesting. Incredible. Talk to me a little bit about what the study tells us in terms of how authors of color are faring. So the, the top line numbers overall show that, you know, for example, black authors make less than half of what white authors do. Startling. The study doesn't really tell us a lot more about diversity in publishing, except for the fact that publishers and authors, the future is really, the diversity is going to be crucial to the sure. future. Such a big issue in the book world Because, right well, now. you know, we live in a diverse world. Yeah, absolutely. In order for, to make the pie bigger, for writers to make more, we're going to have to be more inclusive and get more voices in. The publishing industry has lagged behind doing that. They're trying to do better. You're seeing more, more of these books published, which is great, um, but we have a long way to go. Absolutely. And just a final quick question for you, Andrew. What should aspiring authors take away from this? Well, I know what the Authors Guild would say, and that's <laughs> advocacy, 
right? That, you know, what, what the Authors Guild is, I think, trying to do with this survey is show that we need a system that treats writers better if we want to continue to have books in literary culture and that $2,000 a year is it's not, not going to get, get yeah. it done. Yeah. Um, but it's a broader issue than that too, I think. I think we can look at fair contracts and copyright protection, all the things that the Authors Guild goes for. But also it would be nice if we had health care and affordable tuition and things like that that would also help writers a lot too. So it's a bigger issue than just advocating for just that. contract terms. Absolutely. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for coming by. It's great to chat with you. It's my pleasure. All right. Thank you. Now we are going to head over to author and columnist Linda Stacy, who is here with her always uncensored reviews. Oh, stop stressing out because you have to buy presents. And everyone hated the sweaters you bought last year. On sale, which you couldn't return. But you can't go wrong with a book, right? And now I'm going to make that part even easier for you. History buff? Here's one they probably haven't read. Flirting with Danger, The Mysterious Life of Marguerite Harrison, Socialite Slash Spy by Janet Wallach. This book is a true life story about the only female American spy in World War I. Marguerite's father was one of the richest industrialists of his age, but she married for love. Big mistake, because when her hubby died, suddenly she was left not just bereft, but broke. So what's a girl to do? Work at a newspaper and become a spy, of course. Marguerite was jailed, starved, and slammed into solitary confinement. She crisscrossed the world, had epic, uh, what do you call them? Right, relationships on both sides of the aisle, lived in Germany and Russia as a spy and everywhere else she shouldn't have been. But this woman brought home the goods, helped win the war for our side and kept on spying. Love long fiction? I'd say gift the book Covenant of Water by Abraham Verghese, which comes in at 775 pages. Verghese's novel was inspired both by his work as a doctor and by his mother's tales of India. The book follows three generations of an Indian Christian family in Kerala from 1900 to the 1970s. The characters are lovably strange, and although no one goes more than a few miles from home, we're okay with that. What's not okay is that the family has a water curse on them. Terrible things like drownings happen to generation after generation, mostly because they are genetically unable to swim. So what happens is that you worry about every single new baby born. Oh, and then there's the leprosy. <laughs> this is a great gift for someone who wants to hunker down when it's too cold to go out. Not much happens, but we don't need much to happen to get wrapped up in this family. Now, for the person on your list who will hate everything you give them, try something they can't hate. Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind by Yuval Noah Harari, a writer and professor by way of Oxford and the University of Jerusalem. This book tackles our whole history, starting with how we humans got to control the planet in the first place. And do we really? Think on this quote of Harari's. For thousands of years, we have gained the power to control the world outside us, but not to control the world inside. You could stop a river from flowing, but you could not stop your body from becoming old. Really? Damn. I thought that was guaranteed with that $180 cream I just bought. Harari is one of the great brains of our time. His book, one of several he's written, can actually change your life. So here's an idea. Gift it to a grouch but also gift it to yourself. For Uncensored, I'm Linda Stacy. That is our show for today. Thanks so much for watching. We'd love to hear what you think, so please check us out on social media. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. See you next time on Book It.